Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver I think Andrew McCabe has made a fool out of himself over the last couple of days, and he really looks to me like sort of a poor man's J. Edgar Hoover. He's a, uh, I think he's a disaster. And what he was trying to do was terrible, and he was caught. I'm very proud to say we caught him. So we'll see what happens. A fool's. Um, your response? Wow. Um, you know, it, it, uh, you think someday you'll get used to this, and it, on some level you never do. I've been listening to the president lie about me since October of 2016, and he somehow finds new ways to do it. I mean, just two days ago, he tweeted that he had never said anything bad about my wife, which is remarkable. He's been calling her a criminal and corrupt for, for two years now. It's horrendous. But this one was really interesting to me. Um, the president, and you know, he, he goes to his tried and true, you're, you're a disgrace, you're a disaster, those things that he likes to say. Um, but in this one, he actually starts talking about the IG investigation. He seems to make some effort to distance himself in a way from my firing, uh, in a way that I find to be um, just patently ridiculous. Do you think there's a direct line between his statements and the tone he set about you and, and around the, the IG report into you? that affected the outcome? Well, here's what I'll say, Nicole. Yeah, it was uh, curious and certainly concerning to me when the president brought me up to Jim Comey on three separate occasions in those private meetings. He'd say things to Jim like, what's the story with that deputy director of yours? Does he have a problem with me? So from the very beginning, I got the sense that the president wanted me out of there. Um, so for him to say today that, oh, it was somebody else fired him as a result of this IG investigation, um, it directly contradicts my own experience. And I would add, and something that I haven't discussed before, and I'm very careful, uh, I have to be careful in the way that I talk about this, um, but I have seen the letter that the president wrote purportedly himself justifying the firing of Jim Comey. What does it say? In a rambling four plus pages, it goes through all the different reasons why he is firing the director of the FBI. Now, I'm not going to go through all those with you, but I will tell you that one of them is he claims to, to want to fire the director of the FBI because of his failure to fire me. And that was a letter written long before the IG had concluded their investigation and drawn their, I believe, false conclusions in that report that I'm still, um, still having to deal with. So for the president to say today that, oh, you know, he, we caught him and it's a result of the IG investigation is just simply contradicting the fact. Well, let me make sure that, that I'm catching all this. You've seen the letter that instead of this three-page memo from Rosenstein, the president wanted to accompany with news of Comey's firing? That's right. The president wrote his own letter mm -hmm. that he, I guess, was thinking of delivering to the director, firing him. And it was that letter that the group gathered to discuss on May 8th, the day before Jim was fired. And in it, it includes his desire to um, fire him in part because he employed you as his deputy? That's correct. Jim's failure to fire me is cited as a reason why the president was firing Jim. And that letter was written by the president before you were ever interviewed by the inspector general. It is Thursday, the 21st of February of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Well, 
Looks like we've got a white domestic terrorist. Uh, it, according to the filing by the feds, uh, uh, this guy was going to kill innocent civilians on a scale never seen before in this country. And we're talking about the Morrow Building being bombed and all those little babies being killed. Among all the adults in the upper floors, too. Geez, we're, we're talking about 9-11. Interesting, huh? A uh, right winger, white supremacist, loves uh, Russia because that's white utopia. <laughs> and uh, there's uh, a guy sitting in the Oval Office giving these people sucker and essentially telling them to go out and kill Democrats and journalists. Guy had a list. Uh, but we will be talking about Jesse Smollett and his faking an attack. For whatever reason, I don't know, maybe he thought it was a career move. And it was, and is a career move. Maybe not in the move that he thought it would happen, but that's what happens. But we'll be talking about that instead, of a domestic white terrorist with a cachet of weapons uh, that could fund uh, probably a, a small five-man mercenary army in Haiti. Yeah, those white guys are coming back. All Navy SEALs, too. You know, you would think that there might be some sort of jobs program for Navy SEALs so that when they come back to civilian life, they can uh, do something other than being mercenaries. You would think. But apparently, uh, you know, all those uh, military survival reality shows are uh, pretty well cast. And uh, the ones that are in the pipeline, uh, I don't know, maybe they're using real SEALs to try to survive man's encroachment upon their environment. You never know. I want to see that Survivor show. Animal Survivor, can you survive the encroachment of human beings in your environment? <laughs> Let's see what kind of skills you have when you're naked and afraid. Wow, what a world we live in. Okay, um, I wanted to mention really quickly, uh, I appreciate all the folks that reached out to me yesterday and today, too. Um, yeah, I've been having my ups and downs. Uh, I feel bad because, uh, you know, I've always been fairly macho and you know, this is a confession. I've been fairly macho about dealing with, uh, issues of sanity and insanity. You know, I, I, I have sat with family members who have gone through major crises and of course, you know, I can be professional and empathetic and all that, but inside I'm kind of thinking, you know, why don't you just suck it up? So apparently I've never had a emotional mental crises crisis that turned into a crisis on such a scale. And, uh, I'm finding myself, you know, doing behaviors that I would always frown upon. I'm finding myself talking to myself. I never have done that. Uh, yeah, I know you don't want to answer yourself, but yeah, I think I've been answering myself too. Sometimes I'll be, uh, it'll be, uh, I'll be speaking to my son out loud and not even realize it. And I have to look around to make sure that, you know, I'm alone. <laughs> you know? Oh, there's that crazy guy walking the store aisle, talking to himself again and answering himself. So uh, it's it's been a bit of a concern because um, I don't want to go crazy. And this this whole thing, uh, this demise of my son, um, I don't it shouldn't be an excuse to go off the deep end. And uh, I might be struggling at times. And I do appreciate folks reaching out. Um, yeah, I'll get through it. I mean, I. I ultimately am aware that I have a clear enough part of myself that I can gravitate to that and find that space. And I can also laugh at the situation, not in any cynical, morose, macabre way. But, you know, I can laugh at myself. And that's always a curative. If you can laugh at yourself and not any, you know, damaging way. Of course, I mean, you can laugh at yourself and beat yourself up. I don't mean that way, but I can still laugh at myself in a situation. So I think I'll be okay. And I also know time cures all and it hasn't been very long, but boy, boy, <laughs> does time draw out now.
my God. All right, uh, what's on the rest of the menu? Well, of course, that was uh, Nicole Wallace and McCabe at the top. Uh, going over, uh, Trump, Trump had written a four-page letter in which he spelled out why he was firing Comey. And the reason he was, one, well, one of the main reasons was that Comey was being fired is that Comey would not fire McCabe. <laughs> so this letter had been written about firing McCabe uh, before the inspector general had even interviewed McCabe about uh, his... Uh, uh, see, I still don't understand. They're saying that he gave uh, media, he leaked the media some sort of information, but he was the information officer tasked with giving the media this information. I Look, in a mobster's mentality, anybody who speaks out is the enemy, is a stool pigeon, a plant. And uh, obviously... Trump doesn't like law enforcement because he's a crook. Yeah, they found McCabe. Oh, yeah, I just love the way that, yeah, we, we found him out. We discovered him. Good thing. Like like McCabe is some sort of spy. Um, Putin threatened us yesterday, threatened the United States of America. And what did Trump do? He attacked the free press and America's core values. Not one word about Putin rattling his sabers. And Barr is going to be Bork. I told you so. Institutionalist. Yeah, the institution of making sure the Republicans are going to stay in power. This is the thing that bothers me the most. This whole debacle, all this corruption, all this, this subterfuge, all this treason and selling out to the Russians, Putin in particular, is because the squares cannot stand the hippies in leadership anymore. Damn it, we had to put up with the Clintons and then the black guy? No more, no more hippies. We'll give the country to the Russians before we allow that to happen again. Yeah, the idea of conferring rights upon people is the worst thing that can happen to the GOP. Because they're all about taking rights away. And Putin seems to be well equipped to do that. He's got a perfect model in which to be able to uh, go forward. But it is heartening to know that... Uh, <laughs> The wheels of this bureaucracy don't stop turning just because a demagogue says stop. There's going to be some dogged FBI agents doggedly pursuing this, and it can't be stopped. And Trump really fears that. All right, what's on the rest of the menu? Well, of course, then here in the Bistro Cafe, we'll be talking about Indiana Republican lawmakers Strip the state's hate crimes bill of any hate crime protections. Well, of course the GOP would do that. The House GOP, and that would be the U.S. House of Representatives, of course, has issued new demands to take food away from families in need. I keep telling you, they're not, they're not for helping people, giving people things. They're, they're, they're all about taking things away. Makes them stronger, doesn't it? And House Democrats say the Trump administration has interfered with an investigation of Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. Uh-huh. They haven't. She's not the only one that they've been uh, putting their little fingers on the scale. After the break, we then move to the chef's table, where the FCC is given Janine Perot 24 hours, and that's even less now because I was yesterday. I think she's down to about six hours now to stop flouting the law and come clean on her 14-year-old campaign debt. I, I, I don't understand. Other people have gone to jail for this a lot quicker. And the number of hate groups in the United States has reached a record high, and almost all of them 
or white supremacist hate groups. I'm shocked. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice to the right-ish of the page the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. If you then would uh, gaze over to the left-ish of the page, at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will then notice the contribute button. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, that would be grand because your generosity helps us pay the bills and we are truly unable to do this without you. Follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Thank you, Tom, for taking care of that. And you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I take care of that myself. I don't have an assistant. It is all me. The galley is much too small to bring in any other people to cook. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Confined by space, learn to adapt. <laughs> Indeed. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And if you would like to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Cookbook West. Pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, YouTube, iHeart, and wherever fine podcasts can be found. Okay, this uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is Out of Think Progress by Zach Ford. The Republicans in the Indiana Senate approved a sweeping amendment to a hate crimes bill that essentially strips it of even doing anything to address hate crimes or anything at all. Boy, they love to make them toothless, don't they? Oh, you want black people to have rights? Guess how many gumballs are in this jar first? Indiana is one of only five states that doesn't impose any additional penalties for committing hate crimes. Senate Democrats had introduced a sweeping bill, SB 12, that would have established more robust hate crimes protections, as well as mechanisms to train law enforcement on recognizing, investigating, and reporting bias-motivated crimes. Well, it would be hard for the cops. Because if you look close, there's a lot of white supremacists in the cops. I'm not a kidding. I'm not talking out of class here. I think that this is a great scandal and we need to uh, maybe root them out. <laughs> Unbelievable, if you ask me. Well, on Tuesday, Senate Republicans delayed the start of the session by almost two hours while they developed an amendment behind closed doors. They know how to work democracy, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they know how to work it. The amendment removed significant chunks of the bill Democrats had proposed, substituting a tiny addition of text, well, literally two words, that's how tiny it is, to the state's sentencing guidelines that tells courts they may consider bias when determining a sentence. It notably deleted the list of protected identities that, if targeted, would constitute bias for such considerations. Now, Senate Republicans defended their amendment by insisting that the bill now covers everyone. I mean, when there's people out there hating, they have their rights, too, to hate. But by covering everyone, the bill covers no one because there will be no mechanism for assessing bias or reporting it. Now, remember, the United States is plagued by systems that massively underestimate hate crimes specifically because laws don't include measures for accountability. Well, everybody knows in quantum mechanics that if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Of the thousands of police agencies across the country that agree to participate 
in the FBI's hate crime program, a vast majority of them inconceivably report zero hate crimes every year. Indiana lawmakers have an unfortunate reputation for opposing any LGBTQ inclusive legislation. In 2015, they passed a religious freedom bill that justified discrimination against LGBTQ people, which they later amended after a national outcry. Now, also this session, a bill that would mandate discrimination against transgender students is also on the table. Singer of Share Blue Media brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Well, look, <laughs> if Republicans, the right wing, the authoritarians of that party, the Freedom Caucus, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Jimbo Jordan. Wrestle with this, mofo. These people have no problem locking up babies and icebox baby gulags, uh, uh, taking food away from kids right out of the mouths of babes. They love doing that. Their whole purpose in life is to be able to inflict as much pain and discomfort upon others, especially those who are... Uh, shall we say, incapable of taking care of themselves. Republicans may have failed to kick needy Americans off food stamps during Trump's first two years in office, but that doesn't mean they're giving up. And why should they? I mean, it's not long that this guy's going to be in office. I'm not saying Pence is going to be taken over and they're going to continue being able to do what they're doing. Pence may be caught up in this, too, because that little mofo's been lying as well. I mean, he's a paid liar. He worked for the tobacco companies as a paid liar for years. So uh, they, being the GOP, is going to try to push through. It's disaster capitalism, the shock doctrine. There's a disaster. Their demagogue uh, guy that they've been backing is going down, and they're going to try to uh, push through as much as they can. It's what they always do. 65 Republican members of Congress wrote a letter to Trump's Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, supporting Perdue's plan to create work requirements for people to receive food stamps. In the letter, Republicans peddled insulting, inaccurate myths about food stamp recipients, such as that they claim that they're lazy. And they choose not to work because food stamps have become their way of life rather than the short-term fix when they're in a financial bind. Well, none of that is true. More than half of beneficiaries are children who cannot work in order to feed themselves. And the average length of participation in the program is seven to nine months. But the GOP lawmakers are saying, hey, we're not taking the food out of the mouths of babes. We're talking, we're talking about their parents. Their parents are losers. And if their parents are losers, the kids have to lose, too. It's only God's way. Well, those GOP lawmakers also argue that food stamps have disincentivized self-sufficiency. That's hard to say. Hey, hey, Luntz, come in here and fix this. <laughs> disincentivized self-sufficiency. Wow, spit that out which they claim is a significant problem that can only be solved with onerous work requirements. Yes, you must work, and you must, must work for nothing, and you must be beat while being uh, forced to work. Well, the ultimate irony here is that Trump's own supporters may be hurt most by any food stamp work requirement changes. A report from May 
found that food stamp work requirements would disproportionately affect low-income residents in states that supported Donald Trump for president. Unfortunately for those folks, you get what you vote for. And I would also say there's a significant segment of American society who feels that you must be hurt by the one you love. Think Progress brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Democrats suggested that the Trump administration tried to get rid of the Education Department's acting Inspector General, Sandra Bruce, for looking into Education Secretary Betsy DeVos's decision to reinstate an accreditor of for-profit colleges. Now, this isn't the first time the administration has been accused of not only violating norms in the administrative process of agencies, but pushing against legal boundaries as well. In a letter sent on Tuesday, five House and Senate Democrats referred to a letter sent on January 3rd from Mick Zays, the Deputy Secretary of Education, which asked Bruce's office to, quote, Reconsider any plan it might have to review on the controversial decision to reinstate the accreditor. The letter was signed by Representative Bobby Scott of Virginia, Senator Patty Murray of Washington State, Elijah Cummings of Maryland, Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut, and Gary Peters of Maine. Democrats say Zay's letter is a clear attempt to violate the statutory independence of the Inspector General's office. Zeiss also wrote that it is disturbing that your office appears to be responding to a congressional request that is really a disagreement over policy and the merits of the department's decision. Democrats also said they want more documents about the decision to replace Bruce by March 5th. Bruce replied that the office would continue the review of the decision about the accreditor Accrediting Council for Independent Colleges and Schools, affectionately known as ACICS, I think we will call it AXIS, ACICS, ACICS, ASICS, there, there we go, ASICS, but would no longer engage with the department. Independence, in appearance and fact, is key to the effective operation of an OIG, Bruce wrote, adding that the federal law that does not allow department leadership to stop the inspector general from, from investigating an issue. Well, this is different. This is Trump and his people. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Wow. Now, ACICS oversaw the now-defunct for-profit college chains, ITT Tech, and Corinthian Colleges. You remember all those advertisements now, don't you? In December of 2016, Education Secretary John King withdrew its recognition. In March of last year, a federal judge said the department did not consider key evidence at the time and ordered the department to reconsider ACICS, but another review of the group over the summer of last year by Education Department staff still found that ACICS failed to meet numerous federal standards and there was no evidence that it effectively evaluates recruitment practices by institutions. In other words, there's got to be money being paid under the table. Zeiss called Bruce a few weeks after this exchange and told her that she would be removed from her position. 
Oh, man. Remember when Sally Yates came in with her hair on fire and said, you know, Flynn, Flynn is is a Russian spy. And, and he's been talking to the Russians even now. And uh, they fired Yates because they already knew that. They told him to. And they knew it was illegal. Just like this. The department chose Phil Rosenfeld as deputy general counsel as his acting inspector general in late January. But Democrats in Congress said it would damage the inspector general's independence to have its in-house legal counsel take on a role overseeing the department's potential incidents of fraud and abuse. Only two days later, Education Department spokeswoman Liz Hill told media that after they reevaluated the situation, the decision was made in an abundance of caution to rescind the designation. Well, talks about replacing Bruce happened before Zay sent her a letter about the inquiry into ACIS, her being Bruce. It's not just the Education Department. Many members of the Trump administration have demonstrated a loose understanding of their ethical and legal obligations. In February 2017, for instance, the House, the U.S. Office of Government Ethics called on the White House to consider disciplining counselor to the President Kellyanne Conway after she told Americans to buy items from Ivanka Trump's clothing and accessories line while she was interviewed from the White House. According to a section of the Standards of Conduct for Federal Employees, they can't use their public office to endorse products. Oh, but that's for little people. That's for little people. Everybody knows that. The Trump administration has not always moved forward with a strong legal basis for its policy moves. A federal judge ruled in September that actions taken by Betsy DeVos to stall protections for defa- defrauded students were illegal, procedurally invalid, and arbitrary and capricious. And I'm sure Betsy DeVos said, of course, I love doing that. In May of last year, a federal judge said the Education Department violated privacy laws by using Social Security Administration data to determine loan forgiveness for borrowers defrauded by Corinthian colleges. Let's go to our break and mull that over. And when we come back from the break, you know we're going to go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. In Latin America, Native Americans, Africans, and Europeans have intermixed for centuries. So, a few years back, researchers sought to learn more about the ancestry of more than 7,300 people from Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. The volunteers provided DNA samples, and they also answered the question, what do you think your background is? Turns out that what they thought, that is their predicted ancestry, told a different story than their genes did with skin color a key factor. Their predicted ancestry is actually very well correlated with their skin color, but quite poorly correlated with their actual genetic ancestry. So that showed us that people are actually trying to predict their whole ancestry by just looking at their skin color, which is a pretty crude thing to do, but that's how the attitude is in Latin America. Kostu Badikari, who studies human genetics at University College London. In particular, lighter-skinned volunteers tended to overestimate their European ancestry, whereas darker-skinned subjects overestimated their Native American or African backgrounds. Now, a new study by Adikari and his colleagues offers a reason for that mismatch. The skin color data and the DNA sequences led the researchers to identify a genetic variant for lighter skin that arose in Asia 20 to 30,000 years ago. That event appears to be independent of the evolution of lighter skin in Europe. What's it all mean? Well, light skin color in Latin Americans could still reflect European ancestry, but it could also indicate Native American ancestry, 
by way of the original Asian immigrants carrying the trait, who crossed the temporary Beringia land bridge into what's now Alaska and became the first Americans. The researchers were also able to show that this gene variant for lighter skin pigmentation is more prevalent in parts of Asia that do not get much sunlight, indicating a possible way this genetic variant could have been selected for. The new study is in the journal Nature Communications. Adikari says the findings could help modify Latin American social views. We know, for example, that there's a big socioeconomic stratification in Latin America, and that correlates to, because of the history of the colonization, to people's European ancestry and a proxy of European ancestry is often taken to be light skin color. So what we are trying to show is that such kind of blind uh, attitude to social aspects is uh, also wrong genetically, that there's also a big variation in skin color from the native side that such kind of simplistic attitudes would be ignoring. A reminder that ancestry, like so much else, is more than skin deep. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Donald Trump is claiming that voter fraud in the United States, quote, all over the country is rampant, end quote. Back with the facts in seven seconds. Listen up. This matters. I'm Lewis Black, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. In 2012, Florida election officials claimed to have identified 186,000 non-citizens registered to vote. But then that claim was scrutinized, and the 186,000 number... That was reduced by 99% to 2,625 possible non-citizens on the rolls. But then that list was examined, and it turned out that that list, too, was riddled with errors and was wildly exaggerated, so that at the end of the investigation, only 85 people in Florida total were removed from the rolls out of a total of 12 million voters. Let's review. Out of 12 million voters in total, 85 persons were improperly registered to vote for one reason or another. The same basic story is now being repeated in Texas with apparently the same result. The bottom line, the claim of voter fraud is a fraud meant to justify voter suppression and foster racism and target immigrants and naturalized eligible to vote citizens. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the American Civil Liberties Union because freedom can't defend itself. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. It looks like the end is near. A number of news organizations, including the Washington Post, began reporting Wednesday afternoon that special counsel Robert Mueller could wrap up his investigation as early as next week. Washington Post also reports the Justice Department is, quote, preparing for Mueller's report in the coming days. According to the Post, and we quote, an advisor to President Trump said there is palpable concern among the president's inner circle that the report might contain information about Trump and his team that is politically damaging, but not criminal conduct. Today, Trump was asked if he thought Mueller's report should be released. That'll be totally up to the new attorney general. He's a tremendous man, a tremendous uh, person who really respects this country and respects the Justice Department. So that'll be totally up to him. Probably worth noting, because we've witnessed such a newspaper war of late, the New York Times has not matched all this reporting on Mueller wrapping up. The Attorney General Barr has refused to commit to publicly releasing the report in its entirety. A Coast Guard lieutenant and self-identified white nationalist was arrested after federal investigators uncovered a cache of weapons and ammunition in his Maryland home 
that authorities say he stockpiled to launch a widespread domestic terrorist attack targeting politicians and journalists. This was a 49-year-old Coast Guard lieutenant. His name is Christopher Paul Hassan. He was arrested last week, and the details about what he was plotting, a full-scale attack that prosecutors say was against media personalities, politicians, and civilians. All of the details now coming out in a detention memo that's been filed with the court in Maryland. Prosecutors say that this man, Christopher Paul Hassan, was stockpiling weapons. They say they found at least 15 guns and 1,000 rounds of ammunition inside the basement apartment of his Silver Spring home. Silver Spring, Maryland, just a few miles outside of Washington, D.C. And prosecutors put it very starkly, very stunningly. They put this at the top of their memo, saying the defendant intends to murder innocent civilians on a scale rarely seen in this country. And that's why they're asking for the judge at a detention hearing to hold this suspect. What's quite stunning is that this suspect has been a a member of the Coast Guard for many years, most recently assigned to the Coast Guard headquarters in Washington, D.C. The Coast Guard has put out a a statement about this, saying that they, in fact, worked with the FBI and the Department of Justice. So it, it, it looks like the Coast Guard may have actually seen some red flags, raised them, and been part of this investigation. Reports say that Hassan had been studying the manifesto of a right-wing terrorist who killed 77 people in Norway in 2011 and had developed a spreadsheet of targets that included top Democratic congressional leaders and media personalities. The list includes Joey, what prosecutors say is a reference to former Congressman Joe Scarborough, now of MSNBC, Cortez, an alleged reference to freshman Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Senator Blumenjew, presumably about Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. Roger Stone is back in D.C. federal court on Thursday. On Monday, Stone posted a photo of the judge presiding over the case on Instagram with crosshairs in the background next to her head. That prompted the judge to schedule the hearing to discuss, quote, why the media contact order entered in this case and or his conditions of release should not be modified or revoked in light of the posts on his Instagram account. The judge's options include revoking Stone's bail. Donald Trump's former personal attorney Michael Cohen's appearance before the House Oversight Committee is now set for a public hearing next Wednesday, February 27th. A federal judge also agreed to postpone the start of Cohen's prison stint for 60 days as he recovers from shoulder surgery. High drama Wednesday during the third day of testimony before the North Carolina State Board of Elections, which is hearing evidence this week to decide whether a suspected ballot tampering scheme tainted the outcome in the 9th District, where Republican Mark Harris leads Democrat Dan McCready by 905 votes and unofficial returns. Harris's son, John Harris, now an assistant U.S. attorney in Raleigh, testified Wednesday that he warned his father repeatedly that he believed Leslie McCray Dallas, a political operative now at the center of this election fraud investigation, was shady and appeared to have illegally collected absentee ballots in 2016 while working for a different Republican candidate in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District. I expressed my concerns based on everything that I did know up to that point, namely my belief that McRae had engaged in collecting ballots in 2016. Now, that belief was based on my review of the absentee voter data that I've already described. I told him that collecting ballots was a felony. Mark Harris is set to take the stand on Thursday. Although Congress is on recess this week, there has been some behind-the-scenes action. The Associated Press reporting that House Democrats are circulating a joint resolution to block Trump's national emergency that could be introduced as soon as Friday. And that's a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener-supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com slash donate. From New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. Vladimir Putin's State of the Union speeches often stand apart from other political rhetoric. And Wednesday's speech in Moscow was no different. For nearly an hour, Putin focused on soft issues like inadequate child care and affordable housing. And he called on the Russian state to help those being crushed by poverty. 
Sarah Wilson Saki is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado, where she researches Russian politics and economic policy. It's a way to show sympathy uh, with the Russian public and the challenges that they face, especially in access to medicine and quality health care in rural areas. But why then spend so much time on pocketbook issues? There's a long-running tradition in people thinking if only the Tsar knew how bad things were, he would go out of his way to fix it, to pressure the local bureaucrats or the local officials to change their ways. Chris Miller is an assistant professor of international history at Tufts University's Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and says Putin's promises of government help are hardly new. What's changed is that he's governed for 19 years and is looking for a new selling point. One survey published last month placed Putin's popularity at 63 percent, down from 89 percent in 2015. For the first time in five years since the annexation of Crimea and the war in Ukraine, Putin faces a popularity rating that's declined fairly sharply. Suddenly, the Kremlin has to find a a new way of mobilizing political support. They were able to rely on Crimea for a long time, uh, but that's clearly worn off, and I think they're out of new ideas right now as to what they can turn to next. That could explain why Putin followed his gloomy welfare speech with a pep talk about the inventors of a new Russian hypersonic missile, who he said deserved the same admiration as the engineers behind the Sputnik satellite. When economic policy fails, sometimes people just need heroes to believe in. Luke Vargas, New York. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 31 degrees Fahrenheit with a possible high today of about 46 degrees. We'll see about that. Mostly cloudy conditions for the rest of the day. Winds are currently out of the west-southwest at uh, light and variable uh, uh, velocity of about 2 miles per hour. And they will then shift in about an hour and a half or so out of the north-northeast, increasing in velocity from 5 to 10 miles per hour. And uh, we'll still remain partly cloudy, and that's what we'll do. So we'll have an overnight low tonight. It looks like in the low to mid-20s. And tomorrow uh, we will be almost, what, 48 to 50 degrees? How dare you? With partly cloudy conditions and uh, rain uh, is in the forecast later on in the day for Friday. But starting on Sunday, I'm sorry, starting on Saturday and continuing for the whole week all the way up to next Saturday, it looks like we're going to get no less than a half inch of rain each day with uh, looks like the temperatures are going to be uh, above freezing. So the the lowest overnight low looks like it's only going to be about 36 to 35. We'll see about that. But copious amounts of rain, at least a half inch. And on some days, it may even be more than three-quarters of an inch. So that's a bit of rain. Right now, uh, dry conditions will continue, So as the, such as they are. Pollen is none. Air quality index is in the good green range at 22 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is now in the moderate range at three. Uh Barometric pressure was actually falling uh, a bit ago, but now it's holding steady at 29.73 inches. Visibility is down to five miles. And when I say dry conditions will continue, I don't know about that because humidity is at 95%. How dry is that, huh? Well, it's not very dry. It feels quite, well, humid and, and still cold right now as well, especially at 31, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And yes, there is 
Somewhat of a crust outside, though it is uh, burning off and melting, and maybe we'll have black ice, so be careful of that. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. They do. All right. The fellow from uh, London, or just outside of London proper, is registering 59 degrees and sunny. Uh, the 7th arrondissement of Paris, France, is recording 62 degrees and sunny. Rome is 57 degrees and sunny. Kiev is 35 and fair. Kabul is 27 degrees with choking smoke. They don't say choking, but if it's smoke, it must be choking. Hong Kong is 68 degrees with rain. Tokyo is 47 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 71 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is a chilly 41 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is an equally chilly 40 degrees and partly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Edwards of Raw Story brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. The Federal Elections Commission, affectionately known as the FEC, is demanding that Fox News host Janine Perot file financial reports from her failed 2006 campaign against then-incumbent Senator Hillary Clinton. The Center for Public Integrity's Dave Leventhal was first to report yesterday that the FEC had sent a letter to Perot suggesting that she had 24 hours to reply, and she's now down to, I think, about three hours now, maybe less. The commission went on to re recommend that Perot use an overnight delivery or courier service so that the report is not subject to further delays. Leventhal noted that Perot has not filed a report since 2011 when she acknowledged owing nearly $600,000 to 20 different vendors. They never pay their bills. Why is that? I just don't know. And actually, um, you know, they're, they, they gave her 24 hours, which is probably down to two or three hours now. And she may have responded. I had to put myself in a bubble. But uh, up until the time I put myself in the bubble here, she still had not responded. And uh, the, the F FEC wants her to stop flouting the law. I would also suggest that maybe they could get her to stop flouting these uh, cocktail dresses. I mean, she's got enough money to continually buy these. I don't know. They look like um, a late night uh, entertainment wear. And I don't mean in, in the boudoir. I mean, you know, out and about, you know, high stepping it into town. Uh, she's got enough money for that. But not to come clean on a 14-year-old campaign debt. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est doux Blue bar 
Barnes of Think Progress brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The number of hate groups in the U.S. has surged to an all-time high, according to a new report from the Southern Poverty Law Center, with numbers rising for the fourth year in a row. The SPLC's annual Year and Hate and Extremism report released yesterday, that would be Wednesday, recorded 1,020 hate groups in the U.S. in 2018. That figure includes neo-Nazis, white nationalists, and anti-government extremists and represents a rise of 7% from 2017. That's in just one year. The report also noted that an increasingly diverse political field, coupled with Donald Trump's failure up until now to follow through on promises like the border wall, have left those on the extreme right feeling somewhat disillusioned. This, in turn, creates the possibility that more will launch violent lone wolf attacks in response to that disillusionment. You mean like a Coast Guard lieutenant who thinks that Russia is white utopia? You mean those kind of lone wolves? They seem to be all linked up with one common cause, though, huh? I can never figure out how it is that lone wolves seem to all have a prime directive. The midterms tended to validate hate groups' fears for the future. Even more are angering to hate groups were the dozens of women elected to the new U.S. Congress, including two Muslims, the report read, for white supremacists. These newly elected officials symbolize the country's changing demographics, the future that white supremacists loathe and fear. Well, I'm all for building a wall around these kooks. Really, let's do it. According to the SPLC, there is serious concern that disillusioned individuals on the far right will give up on politics and take matters into their own hands. You mean like that Coast Guard guy? Good thing we stopped him because we weren't able to stop uh, gunman Robert Bowers, who killed 11 worshipers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh last October. Uh, that guy said, that I, I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. So he went and slaughtered a bunch of people he thought were Jews. And not all of them were, but it's okay. They're Jewish sympathizers. Same thing. The SPLC's concerns are backed up by another report on far-right violence released by the Anti-Defamation League in January. According to that report, almost every extremist-related murder committed in the U.S. in 2018 was carried out by an individual who was either directly linked or affiliated with the far-right. In the lone exception, the perpetrator was affiliated with the far right before switching over to Islamic extremism just prior to carrying out a murder. Most of the white nationalist and neo-Nazi groups operating today are no longer traditionally structured organizations led by known figures. Instead, hate groups are on now almost entirely online, the report read. The increase in white nationalist and neo-Nazi hate group chapters in 2018 show that these Digitally savvy groups are flourishing in spite of Silicon Valley's promises to police them, the report concluded. Well, I would also say that maybe there's a 400-pound Belarusian sitting on a sofa in the Kremlin helping out some of these hate groups. You would think they would be, don't you? And uh, we got a lot to fear. We better keep them in line. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. You know the Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on. We're going to meet up tomorrow for a Blue Moon Spirits Fridays right here. That's what we will do. Hey, the French 77s are always available. Don't forget that. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je 
Je veux changer d'atmosphère T'en mange à d'un hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 